Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 12, verses 49 to 53, and then through J.C. Rowe's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. The sayings of the Lord Jesus in these five verses are particularly weighty and suggestive. They unfold truths which every true Christian would do well to mark and digest. They explain things in the church and in the world which at first sight are hard to be understood. We learn, for one thing from these verses, how thoroughly the heart of Christ was on finishing the work which he came into the world to do. He says, I have a baptism to undergo, a baptism of suffering, of wounds, of agony, of blood, and of death. Yet none of these things moved him. He adds, how I am straightened until this baptism is accomplished. The prospect of coming trouble did not deter him for a moment. He was ready and willing to endure all things in order to provide eternal redemption for his people. Zeal for the cause he had taken in hand was like a burning fire within him. To advance his Father's glory, to open the door of life to a lost world, to provide a fountain for all sin and uncleanliness by the sacrifice of himself, were continually the utmost thoughts of his mind. He was pressed in spirit until this mighty work was accomplished. Forever, let us bear in mind that all Christ's suffering on our behalf were endured willingly, voluntarily, and of his own free choice. They were not submitted to patiently merely because he could not avoid them. They were not born without a murmur because merely he could not escape them. He lived a humble life of 33 years merely because he loved to do so. He died a death of agony with a willing and a ready mind. Both in life and death, he was carrying out the eternal counsel whereby God was to be glorified and sinners were to be saved. He carried it out with all his heart, mighty as the struggle was which it entailed upon his flesh and blood. He delighted to do God's will. He was straightened until it was accomplished. Let us not doubt that the heart of Christ in heaven is the same that it was when he was upon earth. He feels as deep an interest now about the salvation of sinners as he did formerly about dying in their stead. Jesus never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is in him an infinite willingness to receive, pardon, justify, and deliver the souls of men from hell. Let us strive to realize that willingness and learn to believe it without doubting, and repose on it without fear. It is a certain fact, if men would only believe it, that Christ is far more willing to save us than we are to be saved. Let the zeal of our Lord and Master be an example to all his people. Let the recollection of his burning readiness to die for us be like a glowing coal in our memories and constrain us to live to him and not to ourselves. Surely the thought of it should waken our sleeping hearts and warm our cold affections and make us anxious to redeem the time and to do something for his praise. A zealous Savior ought to have zealous disciples. We learn for another thing from these verses how useless it is to expect universal peace and harmony from the preaching of the gospel. The disciples, like most Jews of their day, were probably expecting Messiah's kingdom immediately to appear. They thought the time was at hand when the wolf would lie down with the lamb and men would not hurt or destroy any more, Isaiah 11.9. 9. 
Our Lord saw what was in their hearts and checked their untimely expectations with a striking saying, Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. There is something at first sight very startling in this saying. It seems hard to reconcile it with the song of the angels which spoke of peace on earth as the companion of Christ's gospel, Luke 2.14. Yet, startling as the saying sounds, it is one which facts have proved to be literally true. Peace is undoubtedly the result of the gospel wherever it is believed and received. But wherever there are hearers of the gospel who are hardened, impenitent, and determined to have their sins, the very message of peace becomes the cause of division. Those who live after the flesh will hate those that live after the Spirit. Those who are resolved to live for the world will always be wickedly affected towards those that are resolved to serve Christ. We may lament this state of things, but we cannot prevent it. Grace and nature can no more amalgamate than oil and water. So long as men are disagreed upon first principles in religion, there can be no real cordiality between them. So long as some men are converted and some are unconverted, there can be no true peace. Let us beware of unscriptural expectations. If we expect to see people of one heart and mind before they are converted, we shall continually be disappointed. Thousands of well-meaning people nowadays are continually crying out for more unity among Christians. To attain this, they are ready to sacrifice almost anything and to throw overboard even sound doctrine if, by doing so, they can secure peace. Such people would do well to remember that even gold may be bought at too high a price and that peace is useless if purchased at the expense of truth. Surely they have forgotten the words of Christ, I came not to send peace, but division. Let us never be moved by those who charge the gospel with being the cause of strife and divisions upon earth. Such men only show their ignorance when they talk this way. It is not the gospel which is to blame, but the corrupt heart of man. It is not God's glorious remedy which is in fault, but the diseased nature of Adam's race, which, like a self-willed child, refuses the medicine provided for its cure. So long as some men and women will not repent and believe, and some will, there must be needs of division. To be surprised at it is the height of folly. The very existence of division is one proof of Christ's foresight and the truth of Christianity. Let us thank God that a time is coming where there shall be no more divisions on earth, but all shall be of one mind. That time shall be when Jesus, the Prince of Peace, comes again in person and puts down every enemy under his feet. When Satan is bound, when the wicked are separated from the righteous and cast down to their own place, then, and not until then, there will be perfect peace. For that blessed time, let us wait and watch and pray. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, our divisions are but for a little season, our peace shall endure to eternity. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we've heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, do we believe that Christ has an infinite willingness to receive, pardon, justify, and deliver our souls from hell? In our mind's eye, do we believe he desires to save us and bring us to himself? Second, both unity and truth are important to God, but the important thing is that unity is based on truth. What has been your experience with seeking peace at the expense of truth? Have you ever had to depart from family or friends because of truth? And third, the gospel divides those who believe from those who do not. Does this teaching rub any of us the wrong way? And if so, why? How does this truth challenge or encourage us?